Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Our next presenter is Barbara Lamb. Um, I think many of you may know Barbara, but I want to tell you just a couple things. Um, you know, she is a very special lady. I have been privileged, actually, to know her for over 20 years. And in that time, she has helped, oh boy, I don't know if I have a number on it, but it's got to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in learning to deal with their contact experiences. Really important work. She's done it for at least 19 years now. In addition to that, of course, you know, she's also one of the most diligent crop circle researchers. Guys, she has been in the circles in England every year for 18 years in a row. Okay? It's quite a record. Not too many can say that. Today, Barbara is going to share with us some of her most fascinating and important findings. It'll be a treat. Ladies and gentlemen, Barbara Lamb. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. I need a booster step. Like, like everybody, or most everybody here, except nice tall people. Um, that was a nice introduction from Bob, and I want to thank you both, or all, very much uh, for being here. And it's such precious material, I think, uh, that is to be shared about people who are having the extraterrestrial encounters. And there have been now about 660 different people I've regressed to these encounters. And some people have been able, because they live close to me, uh, they've been able to come for many regressions. And some people I meet just once for a regression, such as in an experience like here at the UFO Congress. But anyway, we have learned so much about this phenomenon, and there's so much more to learn, I'm sure. I'm going to be starting by showing you some slides here and uh, to give a quick run through first about many, many different types of extraterrestrial beings. This scene is a, um, a very typical thing that happens if somebody is driving along the road, particularly at night, and they see a an orb of light or a disk or light shining down from above or they have a beam of light following them and coming in through the back window as sometimes happens and then the car motor begins to slow down and the person thinks oh, what's going on I better pull off the road good thing they do and then they notice that with the car motor completely stopped that they seem to be uh, noticing a lot of light typically ahead of them and the light is sort of diffuse. It's coming from above, and yet it, now it's also down at ground level. And they look out the window of the car, and they see, very typically, three little extraterrestrial beings standing in the light and also in the shadows of the territory. And so this is a typical thing that people will see at the beginning of an experience. People also, as you know, wake up at night and sometimes will see bright light coming in through the windows, sometimes forming little sparkles of light, making little spiral patterns in the room, or it might be more like a beam of light coming in. And then even an orb of light sometimes fl floating around the room and coming to rest at the side of the bed. And then that light seems to open up into one or two or three of these unusual beings and the experience begins. And this is what people often will see, particularly in their bedrooms at night or outdoors in the car situation, beings that look very familiar of this type. And there are many different types of the little greys, different sizes, different shapes, different heights. And, and yet this is a very typical one. This one is not quite as mechanical looking as some of them are. Some people describe the beings as more sort of mechanical or robot-like. But there also are some like this that seem to have luminous eyes. 
and they seem to have expression to some extent in those eyes. We've all heard of the case of Betty and Barney Hill, and this is um, an artist depiction of one of the aliens who met with uh, Betty Hill, and she described in great detail to the artist. I have connected with a wonderful artist in Southern California, Christine Dennett, and she goes by the artist's name of Kesara, K-E-S-A-R-A, -E and many of the people I've regressed to their ET experiences have described the beings that they now, especially after regression, can describe in total detail. And Kassara takes these descriptions, draws the being, and then checks it with the experiencer and makes any alterations, any uh, changes to fit totally the description that the person saw. And this is one of the ones that looks kind of like an older type of being. We have some that seem very profound and, and rather kindly, the kind that look at the people and treat them as if they really are very caring beings. Some of you have heard of the channeling work done by Daryl Anka, and he channels an entity named Bashar, very powerful channeling, powerful personality. And Bashar has described himself as a hybrid, a human alien hybrid from our future. And he's also saying in some of the channel sessions that we humans will be evolving more into this kind of form as the centuries go on. I guess we'll just have to wait and see in a previous lifetime. Many people have experiences with a being like this whom they consider rather gentle and rather sweet. And then we have all kinds of different looks and that's why I'm showing these to you with big bulges on the head and typically so many of the beings have these huge eyes as this one does. And this being, very often they're described as having pure white skin that seems to be pulled back very tightly over the facial structure and over the skull. And this type with a big head, a large head protruding in the back and of course the big eyes as well. And this being, one of my clients, really liked this being and called him my little friend. He had many experiences with this being and this being sometimes had instruments because he would do some poking and probing and DNA samples and skin samples and fluid samples. But he also had an object such as you see right here that he's holding that's more like a wand and that wand, the being used very often for healing, healing problems with this particular experiencer and no doubt with others. Various looks, various descriptions, lots of types of ETs, and some very tall beings with very long necks and kind of little bulges and corrugations in the neck. Very often they have slightly different shaped heads. And so far, and for a while, we will see some that don't ever seem to have any hair, although eventually we'll get to some of those. And this being is very tall, probably eight feet tall, maybe even eight and a half feet tall. And she doesn't look like she'd be particularly friendly and loving, I don't think. But the people who've experienced beings like this say that she is extremely caring and this type of being often is seen holding the hybrid babies, half ET, half human. This being, I guess it's, I hope it shows up better than it looks like to me, this is a model, we have to acknowledge that, and it's a model of allegedly um, the types of ET beings that were found in the Roswell crash in 1947. Poor little being, very short, four, four and a half feet tall. And of course this one is one of the ones who had been killed in the crash and is not in great shape. 
Now here are three beings. Typically, different types of beings work together in the experiences that people are taken to. And look at the one in the middle. The one in the middle with a slightly tilted head and the other one to the right. That people experience these beings as being very sympathetic and gentle and kindly. They very often feel a sense of comfort from some of these beings as other beings are doing some of the medical procedures. And this, as far as I know, is an actual photograph of a Zeta reticulin being, allegedly at Area 51. Poor little being, I think any of these beings that, that stay here for very long on Earth have a terribly difficult time dealing with our environment, our air, our bacteria, our viruses, and beings like this, from what I've heard from other researchers, have been kept in captivity, not only so that we can learn about them, but to preserve them, because the captivity environment has a different kind of air, different kinds of chemicals in it that they can survive in. Some of my experiencers have um, seen little beings like this, sort of studying our plant life right down there on the ground. And some of my people, a few of them, have had experiences where in a previous lifetime, they have been a different extraterrestrial being. And in some of those experiences, they've gone to Earth to study the plant life and the soil, all the components, the water sources. And they also have done this on other planets. Apparently, there's a whole group of beings that goes from planet to planet over a period of time studying the conditions or whether or not the conditions are appropriate for possible life living there in the future. If our planet or if the planet of these beings becomes no longer habitable. So there's kind of a colonizing that goes on apparently over much of the cosmos. This being, I wish we had better lighting on it. And this too might be, I think it is, but it might be a real photograph of a real extraterrestrial being. And one of my clients had been working with me a number of times in the early 1990s. And she always talked about how her three little white guys would come and take her for experiences. And no matter which kind of beings and situation she was taken to, it was always the three little white guys, about three or four feet tall, who would come and take her to whatever that experience would be. She really liked those little, little white guys. And her sister used to share the bedroom with her, and the sister validated to me several times that, yes, when these experiences would begin and the little beings would come, that the sister would see them also. I think that's terrific when we have a witness. But when my client saw this picture that I had, one day she said, oh, there he is, there he is, that's my sweet little white guy. How wonderful, that's exactly what I've been telling you about. The fingers just like that, round eyes rather than the big almond eyes. And he was more of a white color and his skin was so soft. In one of these experiences, she reached over and touched the back of his neck, the middle of the three white guys. She related especially to the middle one, and she touched his neck, and he allowed it, the back of the neck, and it felt like the softest possible talcum powder or baby powder, just lovely. So these beings were sweet, kind, caring, and yes, they would take her to all kinds of experiences with other beings. This being looking kind of old, wrinkled, rather dwarf-like. Uh, this is very similar. This is drawn by Kassara from an experiencer's description. And it's very similar in a way to one of the beings that Whitley Strieber talks, ab talks about and depicts. This particular ET woman is probably at least eight feet tall, maybe taller. And yet, here she is holding 
a little child in her arms. The little child grew up and she's been one of my clients. She remembered a lot consciously about her ET experiences and of course much more detail came out when she did the regressions with me. But she loved this woman. This ET being may not look particularly kindly and loving, but she is. And she's treated children and even adults very, very kindly, considerately, and lovingly. There's a man named Marcus Pizzuti, whom I think is located in Las Vegas. He used to be in Southern California, where I am. And he drew a lot of pictures. He knew a lot. And yet he, at the time when I knew him in the early 1990s, he was not in touch with the fact that he too was having these extraterrestrial encounters. But this is a very clear, I think, nice description of an implant being put into an abducted man up through the nose, usually into the middle of the forehead, the third eye area or sometimes behind an eye. And of course we know implants can be placed anywhere in the human body by these beings. A nice, simple, clear depiction of the mind scan that many, many experiencers go through, usually on a craft, occasionally in their own room at home, with the being putting his face right there almost touching noses eye to eye, and the being seems to peer way into the person. People have described this experience to me. It's as if someone is in there knowing everything that's in the mind, even everything in the subconscious mind or the, the higher knowing. And some people feel like all that information is not only seen, but is actually removed and yet it's not really taken away. They retain their memories and all of their information that they've learned anyway. And then the reverse process happens sometimes that an ET will be looking into the eye of the experiencer and will be downloading information, filling that person with all kinds of information and when a person regresses to this and they say, gee, I don't remember that information now, even in the regression, because they are told by the being that they don't need to go around remembering all this, but they will be activated to remember when the time comes. I've never heard any ET so far saying exactly when that time will be, but there will be a time coming and all that the person has learned in these ET experiences will be accessible to his mind to know consciously. Here's another type of being, almost transparent or at least translucent in the head and the skull area. You can even see a suggestion there of veins. And some beings, particularly when they come and interact with children, they want the children to be okay. They don't want to come and terrorize people. At least many of them, I think, don't. But they sometimes will disguise themselves, disguise themselves briefly, at least temporarily, as a clown. Now, I've actually met a lot of experiencers who, from early childhood, have been terrified by clowns, don't even want to go to the circus. So maybe it's not really working so well that they're passing themselves off to comfort the child, passing themselves as a clown. Here's another one of the older types with a very wrinkled forehead. And sometimes these beings seem to be very wise. This type I'm personally very fond of. They tend to be very tall, at least eight feet tall, maybe more. Very thin, very white skin, paper white skin. and very probing eyes, not the big black eyes, often they're blue. And what we would consider the whites of the eyes are blue as well as the pupils. And this type tends to be a mentor for people. Some people will begin their experiences in infancy or even when they're still in their mother's womb. 
and then they'll have repeated experiences through their early childhood, mid-childhood, early teen years, teen years, young adult life, midlife, and even into older life in some cases. And along with them, right from the beginning, will be a being like this, a mentor who will do a lot of teaching and training of the person, teaching and training of various skills. This being very different looking than what we usually see, but one of my clients, whom I regress many times, would occasionally uh, see this type and liked this type. You know, as we look at these pictures, or at least as I do, I think, gosh, I don't know if I'd feel good being in the presence of that being, especially taken away from home to be with him. But th the people who've experienced this type say, oh, this is a very gentle, loving type, and he does helpful things. He even heals me sometimes of my physical problems. This is another mentor being. This being channeled through one of my clients for about the 10 years that she was coming to me. We had many sessions, and I would talk to him in my office through the channeling that my client did. And he said we could call him Ohana. He said we, the extraterrestrials, do not need to have names because we know everything energetically, we know everything telepathically about each other anyway. So we don't name things and we don't name each other, we don't label things, but we know that you human beings have a name for absolutely everything and certainly for each other. And so you can call me a name if you'd be more comfortable. And he said, why don't you call me Ohana? And we found out later, the client and I, that Ohana is a very nice idea because in Hawaiian, it means family. So we thought, isn't that nice? <laughs> We're in his family. And indeed, as these uh, ex experiences keep coming to light, especially through the regression, we realize that many of these beings out there in the cosmos consider that we are all one family as much as we look so different from each other, but we are, and we need to be able to get together more and communicate more, as many of those species out there do. So here's a crowd of people, one of the drawings by Kassara, and down there toward the bottom, there are these other two little beings, seeing if I can get the pointer going, this one, and this one walking amongst the crowd in a city, trying to be not very noticeable, trying to go incognito, but there they are, actually ET visitors from somewhere else. Only one woman in the background, this one, seems to be aware that, oh my goodness, I just saw somebody really different, and the others just seem to not particularly notice. A couple of years ago, Charles Hall was here giving a wonderful lecture about the tall white beings that are near Area 51, Groom Lake, whom he actually personally met with, consciously awake many times, and that they would glow. And I remember one thing that he said, which was that uh, one of the beings told him that they love their children even more than we humans love our children. Donald Schmidt, who did so much research and still is, on the 1947 Roswell UFO crash, he drew these pictures from people's descriptions, the people who were there, who actually saw the beings, and this is what he determines that those beings looked like. And Bill McDonald, a wonderful forensic artist, has done so much good research over the years, and he drew this picture of the beings in the Roswell crash and how they must have piloted the ships, being very integrated with their seat and with their hands, um, pressing, whoops, pressing into indentations and that their whole biological system and their thought, their mental activity is what actually activated the, um, the craft to fly. 
Now this is a little bit dim, this picture, but a few months ago with my monthly experiencer support group, we were sitting outside at one of the members' homes, sitting on the patio, and they asked me to guide them in a meditation to um, have a ship come. We could see a ship, or maybe if we were lucky, to see a being. Now I'd like to say that the people who regularly attend my monthly support group, which has been existing since 1994, that they have long gone past their trauma and their fear and are just at the stage where they're more fascinated and they want to initiate contact with many extraterrestrial beings. So that's what we were attempting to do. And even before I finished guiding this meditation, the woman there on the lower left, you can just see part of her, felt that the back of her chair that she was sitting on was being gently rocked back and forth. And she looked around and she saw this being, a very tall being, tall, thin. His face, you can't see it too clearly there, kind of protruded out in front. And he had that big shock of hair, straw-like, kind of wild looking hair and sort of tannish brownish skin and then when we finished the meditation and she said guess what happened and I saw him he was right here we didn't see any craft come but he was there and then the other four people sitting in chairs next to her on this patio said I felt that too I didn't open my eyes like she did and see what was there but I too felt a gentle rocking on the back of my chair. This type, bright red eyes and very wrinkled forehead. Bright red eyes are described on some of them. A wonderful woman in England named Elaine Thompson who said many, many lifelong experiences has drawn a series of pictures of the beings that she's seen. And typically, any one person will see a variety of beings on different occasions and a variety of beings that seem to be collaborating together on the same experience. Though this one has a very unusual cranium from our point of view, unusual. And this kind of being, extraterrestrial, has blue beams coming out of his eyes because he does healing with this blue energy radiating from his very intense blue eyes. And she drew these pictures too with the huge heads projecting out and back. And I can't help but wonder if some of the Egyptian figures that we know about, Akhenaten and his wife and even Nefertiti and some others might have been, as some of us suspect, um, extraterrestrial beings from elsewhere with the very large heads. And that's why they wore those headdresses that extend way out in back and, and up. Elaine also had experience with this kind of being, um, whom she calls a cat being, but this one actually came from Andromeda, according to what the being said. And we've all heard, I think, of the Mothman being. We don't know whether a Mothman being is actually from a different planet, but it certainly seems to be from somewhere that we're not familiar with and a type we're not familiar with. And this little being, bright, bright shining eyes, according to the experiencer's description, and wings and moves very rapidly along, sort of flying upright, right close to the earth. And this being, a Wookiee being, so named by people, and this one, A.J. Gavard, and his wonderful reports of the Virginia, Brazil case. This is a depiction of one of those beings, and they too have very bright red eyes. They're very frail little beings, and they have these interesting sort of knobs or appendages on the head. And then, of course, we know about the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot creatures whom many people believe may be interdimensional, or they may come from the ships, from other places. And yet, 
They're, they seem to be dense and physical at times, but they've been known to also just poof, snuff out and disappear when somebody is watching them. And we'd love to have a real photograph. I have a friend who investigated Bigfoots in Southern California in the Malibu area and the Mount Baldy area, which is in back of my town of Claremont. And she would go many, many times and camp out with a couple of witnesses with her. And they would hear the Bigfoot and smell the incredibly intense stench of the Bigfoot. So obviously, they must be here um, living sometimes, and yet they may go into a different dimension. Several people I've worked with have described this type of being. They call it the Michelin Man because it looks like the Michelin ad and very squat, sort of bulbous. And they actually have interactions with some human beings. And now we're moving into a different category of being, what we can call the insectoid beings. Look at the large eyes that seem to wrap around the sides of the head. And they're usually very tall and very thin, long fingers. And here's another depiction, this one, both of those, and this one by Kassara from Descriptions. And the big long arms, and they often walk with their arms folded up like this one. And here's another type of insectoid. Sometimes they have what looks like little antennae, and sometimes they don't seem to. And here's another one, the arms, very long. If those arms were to hang down, they'd probably drag along the floor. And they often have a sort of bird-like feet. And this one has little antennae. Now, I want to say that the insectoid beings, I think, don't look like they would be particularly wonderful to be with. In fact, it might even be downright frightening if you just suddenly encountered one. However, anyone I have regressed to experiences with insectoid beings, they all report that the insectoids are very kindly, helpful, lovable, loving, and even unconditionally loving. You just can't judge a book by its cover, can you? <laughs> I think this teaches us a very important lesson, not to take the surface look of another life form and make assumptions about it. And this insectoid being drawn by the co-author of my new book called Alien Experiences, which will be I will be selling out in the lobby after this lecture. And she had many experiences with this being. He was very kindly, and also he uh, did a lot of teaching of her, and he'd sit her at a table on the craft, and he'd have her look at books full of symbols that seemed to be cut out on thick pages as in a book. And she was supposed to put her finger in to these cut out symbols. Uh, there was something in there, like a membrane, and trace the symbols. And she was being downloaded with a huge amount of information by doing this. And he'd have her telepathically move liquid in upright um, glass cylinders and many other things. He was testing her and training her in mental development. Another type of insectoid. This one, Katerina Wilson, drew this depiction from her experiences of a very tall insectoid type of being. And then we have what some people describe as an ant or ant-like being. And this one is actually six feet tall. Not the ordinary house ant, is he? <laughs> but these beings do a variety of things and seem to be of the more kindly nature. Then we get into the category of reptilian beings. Uh, David Chase, a young man up in the Seattle area, has interviewed many, many experiencers and has done depictions of the beings from their descriptions. I think this is a very typical, uh, good example of a reptilian being with the unusual skin texture and the um, eyes that are usually bright yellow with a vertical slit. 
And here's another one. They're typically very well built. Often they're quite tall, six feet, six feet five, very muscular, looking in build like a human athlete. And here's another one. They always seem to come across as very intense in their gaze, can be a bit disarming. And yet when some people have regressions to experiences with them, they turn out to not be frightening once you kind of get used to the different look. Many of them are very interested in human sexuality, but they're interested in other aspects as well. And here's another one. How would you like to suddenly find yourself on a craft and looking at one of these? They very often will wear armor or sort of like um, heraldic clothes. Like this one, he likes to dress up in a cape. You can see that he's got long pointed talons at the end of his fingers. A number of different kinds of beings wear the stand-up collar like that. And Nadine, my co-author, again, of Alien Experiences, had encounters with this type of reptilian being and did this. And, and this one has knees that she said never straightened up. They always seemed to be bent, even though he was standing and walking. And the knees sort of projected out behind as well. And this guy, I guess we'd have to say he's a reptilian type as well. And this one, this is where it can be a little unnerving to have one of these looking right in your eyes. Although some of them are benign and I met one in my living room one day, three o'clock in the afternoon. And that's a whole other story I won't go into. But uh, anyway, he was very intense looking and was uh, downloading very interesting information to me, which I appreciated. And this guy, reptilian, but looking a little bit more like a human being. And this one, this was a description by an artist in Los Angeles who took my description of that one who showed up in my living room that day. And, and very, very muscular, greens, browns, beiges in terms of variegated color. And this one with the talons, some of them allegedly have sort of webs between their fingers. And this one, Elaine Thompson's experience, the reptoid being. You see a symbol down there on the left. And um, a lot of them do like to wear badges and insignias and banners across them in that sort of heraldic look. And this one, Elaine calls uh, the aquatic being because it seems to live primarily under the sea. Some of my experiencers, including Elaine, um, have found that in their encounters, they've been taken to an undersea location. Apparently, there really are truly um, undersea bases with certain kinds of extraterrestrials and even underground or undersea cities. And so these beings can swim through the water and come on the land, they're amphibian. Uh, have an encounter with a person, even take the person down into the subterranean, I was going to say, the subsea environment. And she also, Elaine, had encounters with these amphibian beings, very sleek skin, rather like dolphin skin. And they too primarily spend their time in the waters under the seas. And this little guy, I haven't heard him described very frequently, but some people really have had experiences with him. And this little guy, considered by the experiencer who told me about him, to be quite sweet and gentle, short, maybe about four feet tall. And then on the lower left there, you see little black dots. He's, I don't know if these are eggs from this being, um, this is part of their reproductive process, but they look a little bit like beetles, but maybe they evolve into this kind of being. And one of my clients near where I live, and I see her frequently, uh, she has been taken into the ocean in one of her encounters by this kind of aquatic being. She's named him the swimmer, and he'll take her into an undersea location. 
Now we're moving into discussion of the hybrids. This is a bit of a confusing picture. I hope you can make it out. On the left is a woman who's been taken for an encounter from Earth. And then the beings behind the apparatus, one is a hybrid. And um, this is showing that there are fetuses in these glass tanks. And that's a whole discussion. I won't get into about the details of the hybrid program, but these are hybrid babies in the tanks. And the mother of one of these, whose eggs have been used as part of the reproductive process, is being shown that one of her babies, hybrid babies, is being grown in this way. And another one at the lower part of the screen there is a little hybrid baby in a tank and, and various kinds of beings standing around tending this little hybrid. And there are other ones kind of on shelves on the wall waiting to be tended to. Nadine, again my, my co-author, drew this picture of her hybrid. She realized after several regressions that this hybrid who seemed to show up in a lot of her encounters on the craft was actually her hybrid daughters. And of course she recognized that she had had some missing pregnancies and this was the result of one of them. Here's another baby floating in a tank and the tanks always are connected to some sort of monitoring equipment with tubes and cords and so forth. Here's a lovely drawing by Kassara of a description of somebody's hybrid child, hybrid daughter, and looking a little bit more human than some of the hybrids doing do. Maybe could pass here amongst us if her constitution was such that she could live here. And a shock of this very straw-like hair that is often reported. Here's another hybrid, not too different looking than a human, quite similar in many ways. She might be a second or third generation of hybrid. In other words, hybrids will sometimes combine reproductively with humans, and then that hybrid child will do the same. So we think this has been going on for generations, and the more they combine with a human, in subsequent generations, the more they tend to look human. And yet with this one, the hair is very sparse, very short, very straw-like. Uh, Debbie Thomas in Bud Hopkins' early book, um, this was her hybrid daughter. She drew a picture of it herself. And she felt all kinds of mixed feelings about this hybrid daughter, as many experiencers do about their hybrid children. But on the other hand, she had love for her, as well as other feelings. A woman I regressed in Houston, Texas, a few years ago, met with her hybrid daughter a number of times in her ET encounters, and she drew this picture. And she had a lot of love for this daughter, who at the time of this depiction was in her teenage years. Here's another hybrid right in the foreground with a little ET caring for her and leaning against her. This one has a better head of hair, and that would help her if she were to come and be here for a while. I know David Jacobs feels that aliens are living amongst us. I personally have not run into that in the people I've worked with, but perhaps that happens. Um, I'll defer to his research on that. Now this being in the center at the top, is a reptilian male being. And one of my clients in Southern California had had interactions with this being all of her life, starting in very, very early childhood. And eventually, as she got older, and this reptilian male wanted to have children with her, and they had a good deal of sexual activity the way that human beings have it, um, out of that came these two hybrid offspring. These were both hybrid sons whom she met face to face in one encounter in a regression that she did probably about six years ago. And these hybrid children had grown up to be, at the time she met them, uh, age 34 and 36, and she was so proud of them. They were big and tall and strong and muscular and seemed very smart. 
These, being hybrid, have hair coming up from the middle of their head and then clasped together and then falling down their backs as a long ponytail. And this kind, another one of these kindly mentor beings who guide certain people for years and years and years through their experiences and does a lot of teaching and training, even of psychic skills and um, telepathy and skills that the people would probably not know otherwise. And this one from Elaine Thompson, she says, this is an Arcturian, as the Arcturian really is. And what that means is that sometimes the Arcturians apparently, if they present themselves to people in the light of day, that they will take on a different look, quite a variety of different looks. But this is the being she came to know and this is how the being truly looks. Sometimes people see beings like this and they're not sure if this is a human being, they encounter this type on a craft, or whether it's a hybrid being, but we're getting more now toward more human looking types. And there are many different types who come from other planets and um, like this one. And they usually are fairly tall, nicely built, very attractive features from human point of view. Nice hair, typically blonde, typically uh, blue eyes. And Kassara's depiction of a male and female, uh, human-like ETs. One of the things that stands out as being different about them is that they rarely show much change of expression they may experience or sort of express um, caring or lovingness even through their eyes, but their faces don't move. They just don't have the musculature in their face. Perhaps they don't have the emotion that we have. Many beings apparently don't. Now, as far as I know, truly, this is an actual photograph from uh, Billy Myers encounter being Semyasi from the Pleiades on the left and Asket from another universe, the Dahl universe, on the right. And allegedly, Billy Meyer was able, allowed, to take a photograph of them while on one of the crafts. And of course, they look substantially human, although not quite. And here's another human type. Very often we call these the Nordics because they have sort of Scandinavian, very clean cut features and blue eyes and blonde hair. And typically they, they have a very intense gaze as this one does, very typically have blue eyes. Now, we hear about people often not wanting abductions and wanting to know how they can stop them, how they can resist them. And on the other hand, there are people who want contact. They are eager for contact with beings. Some people from the earliest recollections in childhood have had that sense. They'll go outside, they'll look up in the sky, daytime or nighttime, and they'll say, oh, please come and take me home. I don't really belong here. I belong with you. Now, consciously, they don't know who the you are unless they do regressions, as some of them have, and found out that group of being they feel like they're one of, like their true parents or true home is somewhere else. So this is an interesting depiction of a man reaching up and probably with utmost sincerity calling out to be visited by these beings and perhaps to be taken to that other planet at least for a while. And some people I've been discovering in regressions have an experience where they stay right where they are, in bed at home, in a sleeping bag on a camping trip, as with one man I regressed recently, or anywhere here. And when they're asleep and they're downloaded information during their sleep, and according to witnesses around the person when this is happening, the person is so deeply asleep, that's what it looks like to the companion, that the companion even shaking and hitting and yelling at the person just cannot bring them around into consciousness. 
but regression has shown that in the meantime, tremendous downloading of information from the extraterrestrial has been happening with this person. And again, with the explanation that the person doesn't have to carry this around in their conscious mind as they're doing everything else in their human life, but the information will be useful and will be activated again when the time comes. Some people have transformational experiences. They're so spiritual, it's absolutely mind-boggling. And I've known of three cases, totally unbeknownst to each other, where, and in each case it was a man, and the person would be taken out from wherever the experience started by an ET being, usually not the little grays for this type, and they're taken way out into space, maybe to a different dimension. Could very well be, it's hard to tell. And out there in the clearing in the space, they'll see a giant amoeba-like being that the person can kind of look into a bit. They typically are sort of blue with pink and lavender tones, and they're undulating like a big jellyfish would or an amoeba would, and they're really big. I mean probably a couple of thousand feet in diameter in each direction. And the person is drawn into that being and feels very frightened maybe at first. Oh my gosh, what's happening? Ah! But then once they're inside the being, everything is wonderful. It's full of light. It's full of unconditional love. And they have clairsentience. They express suddenly knowing everything about everything. And it's a glorious experience. And when they're taken back out again, they're very sad to be removed from that unconditional love and that knowingness and brought back home again. And some people have experiences with beings that seem to be very human looking, highly spiritual beings, glowing with light as this one beautiful intense eyes that radiate love, unconditional love again to the person. And this tends to be a very enlightening experience. Some people experience being taken, as they say, beyond the veil, the veil between dimensions from our 3D dimension into lighter, faster frequency, different dimensions where a lot of these highly spiritual beings seem to dwell, so they have magnificent experiences. We could also fit this into the category of ET abduction, because they're taken from wherever they are at the beginning of the experience to a glorious experience with one of these. A man from France was having experiences of this type, and after one of his experiences, he painted this kind of being. He said it was like he would imagine being with an archangel, full of love, full of enlightenment, and had very spiritually transforming experiences. And sometimes people are taken to female enlightened beings, probably very much in the spiritual realm. And I've had other people taken to experiences where they meet with glowing balls of light that are just radiating out, spherical shaped or sometimes oval shaped. The people I know who've experienced those describe these beings as being like a ball of light in a way blue. They seem to radiate blue throughout and they're more dense in the center part of this ball or this oval more intense blue and there is a suggestion of deep blue eyes and other little features but yet most of the being would be about this big radiating out in all directions and one person had a regression where she went back to being one of those blue orbs of being and it was apparently long long ago many thousands of years ago and as a blue being, she would find in this other place, I would assume it's another dimension or another planet, and that everyone there was a blue sphere of light with the density in the middle. And after a while, the person would begin to sort of run down 
energetically. And then the aura, the glow, would begin to recede in toward the denser part of the being. And to help themselves to do that, instead of eating and drinking as we do, the being would float into what would look to us to be a temple, a temple-like structure with columns coming down, open walls. They'd float into the temple, which was full of the most glorious blue light and energy. And in that temple, they would be fed energy. They'd just absorb it. That was their energy source for that civilization. And then as they got filled with energy, their own glow, their own aura would extend back out to the full reach. And they'd float out of this temple full of light and go on about their business, whatever their business was. So that person, having experienced that, at a certain point in the lifetime that she revisited as a blue orb of light, um, she was told by other orbs of light who seemed to be sort of teachers or seemed to be in charge, they said, we need a volunteer to go to another planet. We think you would be a very suitable candidate. So they took her to a room where there was sort of a round table uh, that had round glass in it. And they looked down through the table and the other beings said, well, it must have been like a huge high-powered uh, telescope, maybe even like Hubble for all we know. And they pointed down and they said, way down there, you see that little dot? That's a planet we've been keeping our eye on. That's planet Earth. And we would like to have you volunteer to go to planet Earth and show them that there's more to life than just bludgeoning each other and hunting and killing animals and eating meat, eating plants. There's so much more that they could be experiencing. So she volunteered or accepted the assignment. And um, so she found herself on a craft that seemed to be made of light, as she seemed to be. And they had a long, long journey toward that little dot way out there, that planet Earth. And as they got closer and closer to Earth and maybe came more into our physical dimension, she began to realize that her whole glowing orb body was changing. She could feel it and she could see it and the craft was changing. Everything was getting more dense, more physical, more and more dense and physical as they approached the earth. And finally, it seemed to land on this other planet, earth. And she got out and she realized she was no longer a blue orb of light, but she was a physical being, dense and solid and muscles and upright and facial features and hair. Oh my goodness, what an adjustment. She had never even heard of that stuff before. And she went out into the land and guess who was living here then? People long ago, 30,000 or so years ago probably or more, maybe Neanderthals in any event what we typically simply call cave people the early, early humans probably. And they were living by having to kill and, and having to steal from each other to survive and a very rough, basic, primitive life. And so she was here to teach them that there's the whole life of the spirit and other dimensions. Well, as these things happen when a person comes to Earth, they get stuck here if they come for one lifetime, they build up residue. It's been described by certain extraterrestrials. We might call that karma. And so they have to keep coming back again and again, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. It's difficult to get off the wheel of coming here into a human lifetime. So here she is now from at least 30,000 years before. Now she is a clinical psychologist in Chicago doing very wonderful work and having extraterrestrial experiences. And this came out of her first regression. That's where she came from. Makes me wonder if maybe we, you and I, all of us, might have originally come from somewhere else. 
but we've been here a while and all of us have probably built up that residue or karma and we have things that we keep needing to experience and to work out and so here we are again lifetime after lifetime as human beings maybe it's true that in this lifetime that we're in right now that we're learning about many other things other dimensions other beings other possibilities other types of life and maybe if we've cleaned up enough of what we've built up that needs taken care of maybe we too will incarnate another time as another being from the et mentor who uh, channeled through the client i mentioned a while ago she um or the being the man oh hana who said he lives on the binary star system called Antares. They don't call it Antares, but we do, because we name everything. Um, he, he said that, yes, indeed, uh, human beings do incarnate sometimes as extraterrestrials, and that many people on Earth have been extraterrestrials in previous lifetimes. And we may choose to do that again, choose as a soul, and that <coughs> ETs live different lengths of time maybe than we do, very often longer, and eventually they die, they pass away from that existence, that form, and they're in the spirit plane, just as when we humans die bodily, we go into another dimension, a spirit dimension. So I ask this being once of, you know, we're feeling kind of excited about this, thinking, gee, when I die, am I going to get to meet some of these extraterrestrials having died and being spirit forms at that point? And he said, you could if you really look for it, but you won't just see it around you automatically. He said this, the um, extraterrestrials who die, they go into their own spirit plane but it's so close to, it, it's actually almost intermingled with the spirit plane that we human beings go into. So if we look around and if we ask somebody who knows, we can probably meet them. And I think that would be great. I mean, I, I, I hope that's true. I, I want to have that as part of my adventure uh, for myself as a soul after this lifetime. Uh, we're finished with the slides now. So if the slides could be taken off, that would be just as well. And I want to mention um, a number of other things. We've learned so much about extraterrestrials through people's experiences and through the regressions. So, and there's a whole body of material about that. And I've just pulled out a few things. One client felt, uh, found in regression that these ETs have a way of changing their molecular structure very easily and they reduce their matter and to very tiny proportions and they transform themselves into light waves and therefore they're transparent and this kind of figures when we hear reports of light not only from a craft allegedly but light and light beings in the room or an orb of light that suddenly poofed will open up and there will be an ET. They also, these beings, move on light waves. One being said that they can move at 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second, like a light wave would. And that's one of the reasons why they can travel and come here from far reaches. And by the way, not everybody who has an ET encounter has a craft part of the experience. Sometimes it's just simply the being that comes and does various things right where the person is. And then of course, sometimes they take them to a different environment. Another client found out in regression that the ETs uh, can pass information to each other telepathically. Now, most of the people have seen that happen when the person or the beings might be facing each other or might even be across the room. But another way that they pass information is just standing right next to another one with the bodies touching. 
and great masses of information get transmitted to that other one. And then a lot of these beings say that they are getting some people at least accustomed to seeing them. You know, they'll come and allow the person to be conscious for at least several moments at the beginning or the end of an experience. And frequently they reveal themselves, or they will reveal themselves, they say, to all of humanity. And they'll tend to do this when there's a lot of chaos on Earth. So by these short visits that they're allowing people to have, they're getting people sort of prepared that in a time of need, there may be thousands or millions of these beings coming to the earth, and at least some people will be more prepared and able to accept that and to adjust to it. And time after time, these beings are telling my clients that they want us people to learn to be receptive to them, because so many of these species want to come here eventually and um, be of help, be effective to difficult things going on. And so they can only help and be effective if enough people will refrain from shooting them down and considering them the enemy and will be reasonably at least receptive to their doing their very good work here. Reptilian beings have told a couple of my clients that even though they don't look like it from our perspective, they actually have the capacity, some species of reptilians, to feel some emotion. I think we tend to think of the ETs as not having any capacity for emotion at all. But sometimes um, these reptilian beings do, and they say that they even experience love but they experience emotion and love on a much lower level, a denser frequency than humans do. It's not the enlightening, inspiring, transforming kind of love or the madly in love, infatuation love that we can experience. Various ET uh, beings have said to my experiencers that they did participate long ago in engineering the human race. Some of them call it the great experiment, these human beings on Earth. And a lot of these beings, they say, continue to check up on us through millennia. And that's why a lot of people have experiences. And some of these groups of extraterrestrials realize that they have created various flaws in the human species that they helped to create way, way back. And they look at things like our aggressivity, our greed, our warlike nature, our pugnaciousness, our competitiveness, our need for power, our need of some people for domination, for superiority. And some of these species actually regret that they have allowed these components to be part of us. And so, some of these beings say that they come to tweak us and to do a little process with us, of various individuals anyway, to help us to get past those tendencies, which really make life on Earth quite difficult. So some groups are really out there actively trying to correct these flaws. Some people who experience ET contact come to realize that they actually have missions to do in this lifetime on Earth as a human being, and that the missions are inspired and encouraged and coached and prodded on by some of these beings. And that has to do with why some of the ET visits happen, not all of them, but some of them to say to the person, check up, how are you doing with your mission? And keep going, keep going. We're right with you, we're behind you. So an example of a mission might be somebody who's very dedicated to ecological work, to ocean work, to preserving nature, to preserving the environment, to getting clean technology going instead of our polluting technology. 
Some people have the, the mission of doing physical healing with other human individuals and with animal life forms as well. Many different kinds of healings, not, not the usual medical establishment kind of healing. But some of them are trying to even be ready to heal large masses of people when earth disasters happen. I'm thinking of the tsunami, for instance, not that long ago, and how many people were wounded, and, the, the, um, and of course many were killed, but many were maimed and ruined and they needed healing. And Think of the people in Turkey a few years ago when that huge earthquake happened and 6,000 people died just like that. That some people um, are being trained that when those kinds of things happen, that they can send out their thought to a huge area, distant areas on the earth, and heal masses of people at one time. I truly hope that's true. I've regressed several people who've been, according to their regressions, trained to do that sort of thing. Some people are trained to help with particular problems that some amongst us in humanity have. For instance, one woman I regressed had been trained by extraterrestrial beings to work with autistic children. She had not grown up particularly thinking about autistic children, but as an adult, she knew she kept having visits by a particular female extraterrestrial all of her life. She could remember parts of the encounters but when we did regression, she realized that that being, who often would visit her right in her home and never even take her anywhere, was training her over a period of years to work with this particular condition with some children, which we call autism. And she found herself being drawn to doing that. A lot of people I know who experience ET encounters realize that they're very, very dedicated to something some kind of work that not everybody's doing. It might be a specialty work. And they find out in their regressions, if they suspect that they're an experiencer, um, that they are being continually trained, taught, encouraged by these extraterrestrial beings. Many people, I think, including many of you here, and I think including myself, um, are definitely being encouraged whether we're consciously aware of it or not, to inform people about the existence and even the presence of extraterrestrial beings. Some people take more the form of informing people about the crafts, and that's very valuable. I'm so grateful to those people who do that kind of research and have the videotapes and the photos of the crafts. And some people are trained more to talk about the personal part of it, the personal encounter experience through giving lectures and trainings of other therapists as I have done to train them to work with people who have these experiencers or to be interviewed on radio shows or TV shows or to be filmed. There are a lot of films being made right now. I'm absolutely amazed by people who are wanting to get this news out to more and more people. And a lot of programs that are shown, TV programs, about this whole subject that are shown in the US are also shown elsewhere in many other countries. And that's good, it's, it's getting out there. It's wonderful. Many people are being taught in their mission to help people to get past their prejudice of other life forms not only prejudice against ET forms, but prejudice about divergent life forms, different races, different cultures, even different animal forms here on Earth. One woman found that she was trained to do animal rights work. She had a regression where she was three years old, and her primary ET came into her living room while her mother was next door delivering a birthday cake. A little girl was left there. In came her ET and said, you are here to teach people to be kind to animals and stop their violence toward animals, stop all this lab testing and all the horrible things 
that people do to animals here on earth. And she is a dedicated, almost obsessively dedicated person these years working for animal rights work. And some people are being trained to channel, to channel various extraterrestrial beings. We know of some of that work and it's very fine. Some people are channeling music from extraterrestrial beings. And it's music that's very harmonious, very uplifting, very enlightening. Some people are trained to simply develop rapport with various extraterrestrials and to share that we can have rapport with those beings. Some people are contributing to a hybrid race, whether they're aware that they're voluntarily contributing or it just seems to be happening. And many of these races are dying and they need some of our components. And some people have the mission of bringing through technological information for free energy devices that we so badly need on the earth. Some people are trained to develop psychically so that they can use all kinds of psychic skills here with fellow human beings. And some people are actually spokespersons for ETs. If they get the messages, they pass them on so that we can learn more about them and their perspective on us. Some are being prepared um, to educate fellow human beings about other life forms and what they seem to be like from what we can tell. Some are being trained in wonderful healing skills taught by the ETs to do hands-on healing and energy healing, maybe even the kind of healing that we've seen from wonderful Rocco this week, healing with the presence, healing with the eyes, for all we can tell, many different forms of healings. And sometimes people are thought to, taught to project their thoughts out in order to manifest certain things. We probably all have these abilities, but we just haven't known how to harness it and how to energize it enough so that as we think of something, it will come into material being. But some people have the mission of being taught. And a man I worked with actually here this week in a regression had an extremely interesting experience. He knew he'd been having ET visits for years and years, but he didn't know exactly what was happening in them. But in the regression, it turned, that, it turned out that he was on a mission. He will be, and he actually will, be going to Egypt, to the Giza Plateau. And his mission, even though in human life form now, will be to help a large group of hybrid beings, ET human hybrid beings, out of a large underground facility on the Giza Plateau and welcome them to life on the surface of Earth and to help them to integrate into the culture because they're here to actually help. Some people are taken to council meetings. They seem to be delegates on Earth for humanity. And there are huge councils out there. We find out through the regression work many different kinds of beings from not only our galaxy but even other galaxies that get together occasionally in a huge amphitheater-like room, which is no doubt, I would think, in a craft. And one woman was taken from Earth by little ETs, taken to a craft, Clothes were taken off. She's put into what she described as a, like a bathysphere, round structure, not too much bigger than she is by her reach. And she was submerged in fluid and she could breathe that fluid. And for days, it seemed, she was floating in the fluid in this bathysphere on the craft. And, okay, and then eventually, it seemed like the whole process stopped. By the way, the bathysphere was sort of rolling around, which was okay because she was floating in it and submerged anyway. And then it came time for the bathysphere to be open and she was taken out. And at that point she realized that she had five companions who had also been riding in bathysphere, other 
people from Earth. And when they got out of the bathosphere, they coughed and they choked, spit up all this fluid they had been breathing in to their lungs. Ah, and then they were okay. And they were dried off, they were put into robes with hoods, led along a long corridor into a giant amphitheater-like room. And there were beings from many, many, many different ET civilizations. They were all there to discuss various problems. And while these people were there, they were told they were delegates from planet Earth, then they were discussing some of the main problems on planet Earth. Another lady was taken to a smaller council meeting. It seemed to be a smaller room and like a board beating table, a square table. Her mentor was there, the one she knew all of her life. And right across from her were seated the beautiful blue beings, not the round orbs I mentioned earlier, but more oval shaped beings, denser in the middle, suggestion of darker eyes, glowing and tinkling. These beings were so delightful to her, especially with the tinkling sound, like very light wind chimes, that even though they were asking her questions about Earth and about humanity, she couldn't focus, she couldn't concentrate. She was so enthralled with these tinkling, glowing, wonderful beings. There were other people who've had council experiences too. There's so many physical procedures that are done that we wonder about as well. For instance, one of my clients, whom I regressed a number of times, she had a straight line cut right in her inner forearm, about two inches long, absolutely straight. She knew it hadn't been there before. She woke up and there was this little white scar. And she wondered what that was. Her husband also had a little white straight line scar identical to her, same size, same type, same position, although on his left arm. She did the regression to find out what that was about. He didn't, so we still don't know. But anyway, she found out that in this experience, a piece of her vein from the thin skin area of her inner forearm was taken, about a two inch piece of vein, and they fixed the rest of the vein so that that would be all right. And they said that this particular kind of vein had the material in it that would be extremely helpful for the hybrid babies that they were creating. That some of the hybrid babies needed more human cell work in them to be able to survive well and maybe even to come here. Another woman had a straight line cut over her left breast in, her, in the soft tissue of her chest and she had been grieving very, very severely over the death of her father. And one night she was in a bubble bath in the bathtub and then she sensed weird things happening and she didn't know anything for a couple of hours. Woke up, the water was cold now. She'd actually been gone but returned to the bathtub and she had a straight line cut in this part of her body. And in the regression that we did the very next morning, which was wonderful, um, she found out that they were doing something somehow with this cut to ease her grieving over the death of her father. And she did that. Now why would a cut there, why would something being done make a difference in grieving? But she did feel a tremendous release of her grieving. Now another woman in the same ET support group that I have, she said when she heard about this, oh my God, that's just like one that I have over my left breast. And we did a regression for her, and she found out that she had been grieving severely over the loss of a child of hers who had died. And that procedure helped her. You just never know. Another woman had her brain in one of these experiences actually taken out, and as the ETs said, rewired. Because we know that you're in a slump in your life you're not doing anything and you've got tremendous artistic ability and enthusiasm and you're not using it, you're not doing anything, you're in the doldrums. So they put the brain back, rewired, enhanced, 
healed her all up. She came back. I saw her six months later. She was beaming and blooming and she had formed a creative arts center and actually rented a building and had all these different artists and musicians coming in and performing and displaying their art in art studios. She was happy as a clam. And we think it was because of that work that was done by the ETs. So, boy, there is so much to share and so little time. So I'm going to run on to other categories of healing, people being healed by ETs. And I think this is extremely significant. People have been healed in their ET encounters by um, various methods, laser beams of light, placing of ET hands and emitting energy and various ways, sometimes, as with that one being healing through the eyes. People have been healed of breast cancer, of colon cancer, which is very difficult for us to deal with. A woman was healed of a very bad ongoing sinus infection. People have been healed of reproductive problems where they haven't been able to bear children. And then various procedures are done sometimes after producing hybrid children, sometimes not. <clears throat> but the ETs have actually fixed the reproductive organs and the person goes on to have human children, healthy human-human children. One woman I worked with had a very bad, uh, as a little girl, had a very bad sexual experience by her own grandfather. Her ETs, who keep a lookout on her, they came, they interrupted the experience before it did too much damage. She was only three or four years old. At the time, they removed her from the house. They put her in a little garden shed out in the backyard, and they put, as she described it, like an invisible warm blanket over her and around her. And then they went outside and locked the door of the shed so the grandfather could not get to her there. Eventually her grandmother came and realized that's where she was and unlocked the door. But they, they were aware very often that we have drastic problems and they can actually help to heal us. Many, many examples of that. And people receiving great in, information during sleep. We all wonder about hybrids, those of us who think about these things, and why? Why do these different species do that? They give reasons such as that we are helping them by our material to save a dying race. They're too inbred, they're too weakened, they can no longer reproduce, or they've been harmed by nuclear radiation, a good lesson for us. Sometimes they, use, need our, they need to create a hybrid who could be here on Earth longer and maybe even to live here. They need to create hybrids who can withstand our germs, our bacteria, our viruses. They need to create beings that can be more physically substantial than they are themselves. And some of them want the component of emotion because most of them have very little, if any. And they also want to have beings that are go-betweens between us and those beings on their planet, like knowing, friendly ambassadors. Maybe we can consider that we all are more knowing all the time, hopefully friendly ambassadors between us and these other races. Thank you very much. <laughs>